Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. Today we're in the government offices in Kiev, Ukraine, with Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Digital Transformation, Mihailo Fedorov. Thank you very much for joining us. Perhaps I'll start with asking you about digital transformation. This ministry was created in 2019 because President Zelensky had promised that Ukraine would be a pioneer in e-government. But can this digital transformation continue during the wartime, or have you had to transform your ministry's activities into something else? We had four main tasks, to digitalize all public services, to connect 95% of the population to the internet, to develop the IT economy, the digital economy, and to teach people computer literacy. And indeed, during the war, we put all of these tracks onto a war footing. Now we are providing services that are connected to the war, such as subsidies, registration of damage to property, we are reconnecting the internet in de-occupied territories, We've installed Starlink in Ukraine. And as for the IT economy, we are now creating a kind of digital blockade of the Russian Federation, working with tech companies from all over the world to get them to leave Russia. And often that means they move their business to Ukraine. You just mentioned Starlink. Uh, am I right in thinking that you just wrote a tweet saying, Elon Musk, please give us Starlink, and he said, OK? Can you tell me, how did that really happen? As with many tweets, there's a longer story behind it. We'd been in touch for a long time with SpaceX, and for the past few years, we'd been doing everything we could to persuade them to start working in Ukraine. But it's true that after that tweet, the process of getting Starlink up and running in Ukraine speeded up. And what are the... Um, or rather, what applications have been created uh, by your ministry or under the guidance of your ministry during the war? I'm thinking of uh, particularly this thing called Evorog, which allows people to um, denounce the presence of Russian forces. Thanks to our DIA app, which has verified users, we created a chatbot that works with DIA, so we can check its users are genuine, that allows people to send information about the movements of the Russian army, concentrations of their forces, where there are traitors, any information that can help our military. And thanks to that, we obtain quality information, which we sort and send to all the relevant entities. Do people really use it, though? How many people have actually... Up to now, over four or five months, because we created it during the first month of the war, we've received more than 30,000 messages, and that means photos and videos and detailed descriptions, so it's a lot of information. How can people who are using that be sure that they won't be traced or get into trouble, though? There's a set of instructions for Ukrainians who use this bot, including to only give information if you're sure nothing will happen, and to delete the evidence once you've sent it, to make sure no one can see you when you're sending it. So there's a range of recommendations that we put out to make sure people take care. I want to ask more about the DIA app also. You've got the logo of it behind you. It's the real flagship thing of um, your ministry before the war started, that Ukrainians can have their passport, driving license, all electronic. I'm not sure there's another country which has that. But is it really safe from hacking at this time when Ukraine is under so much threat from presumably people who would like to hack Ukrainian applications. In fact, for us, the war started as a cyber war as soon as we created the ministry and the DIA app. Right from the beginning, there were attacks, and so we built the architecture in such a way as to not save data, so the registries would be safe. And so we didn't have any leaks of information. And during the war, far from stopping work or having problems, we rolled out new services because the architecture is safe. Also because in the cybersphere, we are also attacking, there is a real war going on, yet we are still putting out new services. The data is safe, the architecture is built safely. Now we have not only DIA, the customs, tax service and pension funds have also been digitalized. Before this invasion started, there were a few cyber attacks and there were a lot of experts saying that any increased Russian aggression would be accompanied by massive cyber attacks. As far as I know, it hasn't happened. Why not? 
Before the war, there were powerful attacks in December and January and February. They were really unprecedented attacks, but we have successfully defended against them. But everything changed after the physical invasion of Ukraine because we started to attack. And when we started damaging Russia's digital infrastructure, they started redirecting all of their resources to internal defense, which is why now we are developing our cyber defenses, attacking and rolling out new services. Can you tell any more about what kind of attacks you've uh, launched against Russia? We created a project called the IT Army, which brings together hundreds of companies and thousands of volunteers. There's really a full-scale war going on, with operations and strategic and tactical goals. And I know that your ministry has recently been doing a lot in the line of drones, getting drones and also training people to use them. Why is it the Ministry of Digital Transformation and not the Defence Ministry that's leading the way? It's a joint project between our ministry and the military. Technology is a key component of drones. I'm talking about artificial intelligence, computer vision and lots of other tools. Plus, the field of drones is quickly developing, and it's about military tech. I mean, a whole industry is being born. That's why we created a joint project. We calculated the needs on the front line for reconnaissance drones and for attack drones. And now we're raising money all around the world to buy those drones and make contracts. We're training people in the use of drones. We're repairing drones. And so we made a joined-up project. What's the role of artificial intelligence in the drones? Recognizing objects. Already lots of companies use artificial intelligence in order to precisely identify whether it is a tank or whatever other kind of weapon, or to locate a specific object in the woods, and that helps with taking decisions. And you've also been using artificial intelligence for recognizing faces, yes? Can you tell me what technology is in use in Ukraine and how much? We use artificial intelligence for face recognition. There are various services. When photos appear of Russian soldiers who died, we can find their pages on social media and contact their loved ones and tell them about the death so they collect the body. Generally, you can identify the person. Artificial intelligence is today being used in various situations. For example, we have a service that allows us to recognize moving objects and determine whether it's a military object and put it into the system that logs those things. Wherever you look these days, AI is in use. Have you used it then to recognize Russian soldiers who are dead and contact their families. I think you spoke about this. Yeah. We've had hundreds of communications with the families of dead Russian soldiers on social media. In 80% of cases, the relations say he's a hero, he did right. We'll also come to Ukraine and we'll kill you. But which technology is in use? Early on in the war, this company Clearview said that it was giving you the app. How many people in Ukraine are using this app or is it a different? Uh, artificial intelligence face recognition. We use various solutions. I can't talk publicly about which brands we are using in particular, but it is used. When the company Clearview gave you their technology, you very publicly uh, celebrated this fact. But now you're saying you don't want to specify which technology exactly is being used for facial recognition. Why? We have certain agreements with different companies that mean we can announce that we started working together. With some of them we can, with others not. But let's put it this way, in the situations that it's being used, I think it's best not to announce it publicly. What happens if the face recognition technology makes a mistake and you send a message to I mean, is it only recognizing dead Russian soldiers that you've used it for, or also for other um, casualties or for war crimes? There were cases where we used it to find the marauders of Bucha and other places in Kyiv and Chernihiv regions. When the system recognizes a face, it gives you the confidence ratio, 70, 80, 95 percent resemblance. And of course, there are other tools to check it with. Mostly you can check via the social networks. You can see there, for example, that it is a soldier and some information that can allow you to confirm the identity. There are times when we check, but we can't feel sure that the information is confirmed. And there, it requires more work, and support systems have to work. Have you 
Has it happened that there's been a case of mistaken identity that you know of? У нас ще не було кейсів з помилкою, які ми ну впевнені, що була помилка. У нас на We haven't had any cases of mistaken identity or where we're sure there was a mistake. On the other hand, there was a case when volunteers came to us with a request to identify a person that was in hospital and had lost their memory. We identified them and it turned out it was a Russian soldier who was just trying to fool everyone by saying he'd lost his memory. Oh really? Yeah. No. Well, and uh, yes, this was a real case. And so then was that person taken prisoner? Where are they now? I don't know where he is now, but I think he's where he deserves to be. General question about IT in this war. Obviously, Ukraine is a country with great IT specialists and a good reputation for this area, but so is Russia. Does Ukraine have an advantage um, or not? We definitely have an advantage because we have the support of the whole civilized world, countries that have developed tech sectors, we have transfer of technologies, we communicate, companies come to work in Ukraine, tech companies move into Ukraine. So there is support and cooperation, while in Russia it's the opposite. IT companies and specialists are leaving Russia, because you can't develop as an engineer in the IT sector under a dictatorship, when there is no freedom, and when basic services for a creative person like MasterCard, PayPal or whatever aren't working. So, strategically, we are expecting yet more development of that sector, and the IT sector is actually the only sector that is currently growing in Ukraine during the war. It's showing increased revenues, whilst Russia can expect decline because its companies and engineers are leaving. You can't create a tech product with significant added value in the conditions that they have found themselves as a result of attacking Ukraine. Thank you very much, Mihailo Fedorov, for joining me, and thank you for watching. Stay tuned to France 24 for more news.